Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. For some, the independent record store was just another place. But to many, it was more. A rich trove of musical discovery. A vast library of formats, history, and genres. A home away from home. The independent record store was a community space where a countless number of artists, musicians, and listeners both casual and obsessive became inspired. All by sharing the love of music. They're kind of a gathering place, like comic book stores are a gathering place for nerds who like comic books. The indie record stores are a, a good gathering place for the nerds who like music. It was fun to go to seven, eight different little indie record shops and they all had, you know, different kinds of stuff and, and you could kind of like, you know, get your hands on it, you could smell it, you could play with it, you could pull the record out of the fucking, you know, cover in the old days if you wanted to. All through the 80s and 90s, like, touring was all about two things, playing and going to record stores. <laughs> and I can't even tell you which one is more primary. <laughs> I turned 50 this year and I, I still sort of, my dream is still like to, is to have a, a record store. I'd stop in there once a week and just look in there at these bands I'd never heard of. The whole experience, the little record shop was, uh, I wouldn't be playing bass uh, in front of people probably without it. I had met Patti Smith on the kind of New York circuit and I just thought she was beautiful and, and utterly beguiling. And uh, I wrote an article for Jazz and Pop magazine about a cappella records, doo-wop records without instrumental backing, that there was a small movement, mostly centered actually around independent oldie stores. So she called me up and thought, said that was a really you know, beautiful article, and I said, well, come on and visit me uh, at Village Oldies. I'm working there Saturday night. And so she would start to come in, and uh, when it was quiet, I'd take out records from the stacks and put them on, and we'd play, and we'd dance in the store, and had a good time, and it was almost like a place where we got to know each other. The independent record store was the space where the transforming power of music brought everyone together. Ideas, opinions, and histories were shared. Bands and friendships were formed. I've actually had people say to me that two thirds of who they are was formed by them coming here, and that's like, that's heavy. You know, they're like, I wouldn't be the person I am today if it wasn't for trash. And it's like, wow. Like, you know, am I your parent? Am I your therapist? People come in and tell you about, uh, you know, uh, their depression, trying to kill themselves, you know, like all sorts of really heavy stuff. I've talked to kids out of a lot of bad tattoos. Ooh, I don't know who's gonna do that now. Um, I will. Good for you. <laughs> Growing up in, in Detroit Rock City, where everything was was Ted Nugent and Bob Seger and Jay Giles Band and Boston and Styx and Journey and REO Speedwagon and all that mountain of classic rock shit that did not do anything for me. And I would just sit there and listen to the radio and go, what is wrong with me? Hearing things like Devo and the Gun Club and the Cramps and Black Flag and, and, the, and the Sex Pistols and, and finding other people that like that stuff, it quite honestly saved my life. Today, these stores have fallen on hard times as over 3,000 independent record stores have closed across the U.S. in the past decade. It happened to the store I grew up with, Record Express in Middletown, Connecticut.
So is this catharsis for you, breaking down the, uh... No, this, I don't stuff. enjoy doing this. I enjoy talking to everyone coming in. You know, um... I like, it's actually been kind of a fun week in the sense that we've been busy and people's, like, positive energy has been, like, you know, having people bring their kids in and people like, oh, I bought my first record from you or I would have never heard about this if it wasn't for you or... You know, like there's been one kid came in and shook my hand, and he was he didn't even know. And he, I was like, Oh, we're closing next week. And he went, What am I gonna do? And then he like ran out. I haven't seen him since. How long have you been here? 10 years. 10 years. Are you ready to move on? Um. In the summer of 2006, Record Express closed to become a tanning salon. It's perfect, you know, like, I can't think of something better besides a police substation that, like, would be, like, right. <laughs> it's awesome. Just a year later in May 2007, Trash American Style in Danbury, Connecticut announced they were being forced out of their space by a printing shop next door only after 17 years of being in the same location. First the guy tried to buy us out and we said we didn't want to sell. We were not interested in selling out. Then this guy was going to go ahead and buy the entire building just with the aim of getting rid of us. So come the day to sign the lease extension, the landlord says, eh, don't bother, we already signed with uh, your neighbor for 10 years and uh, you're out of here. See ya. All the trouble of this idiot went through at this print shop to maneuver us out of here and try to get us out of here. He could have bought his own building. He could have moved his own thing to a bigger space, but uh, it was apparently, that's not the way he thinks. So it took a lot of doing, but he got us out of here. And I'm sure he's very, very pleased with himself and very self-satisfied and very confident that he is a strong man and a big man and a man's man. Yeah, good luck, man. What makes you want to come back here? I can't come back here. Well, you know, no, I know, but what, what made you want to come back here, I guess? Uh, I'm a record junkie, you know, and uh, this is a, a record junkie place to go to. Let's face it, a lot of people can steal a lot of music right off the internet. And if, if they're not brought up with any kind of packaging or artwork, you know, like this. I, know, I almost not, bought that the other day just for the, just for the well, cover. Well, it, you're too late. It was sad because it's the only real record store around here. And it's more than just a record store, it's a place, you know, just for people to feel, you know, they want to be here, you know. And in New York City, you know, record stores open and close all the time, but here, there's not really many record stores. You just can't walk down the street. And we live in Brewster, New York, you just don't see a record store. I was pissed. Yeah. Really mad at that point. I mean, we don't, I don't know where to go now. Yeah. I have nowhere to shop for music. It's like, you know, your best friend's moving away to a faraway land, and you just can't buy a plane ticket to go and find them, you know? And yeah. you never know when you're seeing the guy. <laughs> I've been coming here probably longer than anybody. In the last five years I've been working down the street. I come here every day. I'm going to miss the store. There's an endless supply of music, but there's not an endless supply of good people that are creative, interesting, fun. Places like Strawberries, uh, they really make me sick because like in Stanford, uh, they took over in High Ridge Road and they put a couple of CD stores out of business. And now in the last year, they went out of business, and uh, now there's nothing. So now every, all you got to do is go to the mall and get uh, the top 50, uh, you know, spoon-fed garbage that uh, the mass media, corporate America, uh, record industry shoves down the throat of consumers. And nobody even realized they're being suckered into this bullshit that they call music. The kind of music you want that's interesting and stimulates your mind is in this store, not at the mall. Nice. And it's all sick. Yeah. I'm a big mouth. What's what's your uh, what's your name? My name is John the Bomb. 
thing. It's very surreal. Like, I feel like I'm going to be showing up tomorrow for business as usual, but I'm not. Like, it's weird. I'm almost unable to really, I'm almost like in denial, I guess you'd say. You know? But it's just kind of, I guess, a self preservation thing that. Otherwise, I would have been crying all day. First five days, I just drove in here like every day crying. I woke up crying. I was so upset. And then, you know, I just said, you know, same kind of thing. Like, nobody's dead. Nobody's hurt. Nothing's gone. You know, it's just change. And change, you make it work for yourself, you know? A lot has changed in the music industry, but what the hell happened to all our record stores? stack of records here, a stack of records there. I got records scattered all over everywhere, but I'm Even though the independent record store is the home of everything eccentric, weird, and fun in the music world, the independent record store has always had to rely on the major label record business. Major label record companies are the richest with the most power and resources. Major label titles get the most exposure, advertising, and radio play. And for all the amazing things the record business has accomplished throughout its history, there's always been one problem. A problem that has gotten more than out of hand today. There may well be people who work in re the record industry who like music, and they might even care about music. But I can assure you, the people that own the labels do not, all they care about is money. Big problem with corporate greed and these uh, uh, record companies, and going public so that the record companies have to answer to their stockholders every quarter and show a profit every quarter. Our record company was run by people who would actually allow an artist time to develop. They didn't expect to, for people to have a, a big hit with their first record. Nowadays, because of stockholders wanting to see a profit in their investment, Everybody's got to have a hit with their first record or they get dropped. And there really is no such thing as artist development anymore. Development? I haven't got time to, to develop an artist. I want a hit right now. You know, if that had been the case, we would have been dropped after our first album. Musical tastes and trends are unpredictable. For decades, major labels have tried their hardest to control and create tastes and trends with their control over the distribution channels, control over the acts they support, and control over their fans. 
all to maximize their bottom line profits. In the 90s, rather than invest in acts that would go on to improve, develop, and sell albums long into their career, major labels backed manufactured pop stars in hopes of big short-term profits. You gotta remember in the 80s, the, the record companies started firing anybody who knew anything about music and hiring MBAs. So they got all these bean counters. And that's the moment music became mediocre, you know? When you get accountants running the record companies, you're not gonna have very good music, you know? I've just been over our operating statement. And if I have a heart attack in the next few minutes, you'll all know why. You think we're running a rest home here? Maybe it'd be better if you would just lie down. You can't run a business like a walk in the park. We are going to start working around here from now on, understand? Sales, they've got to go up. Expenses, they've got to go down. And I mean right now. You know, maybe their mission was always to make money, like how many pairs of shoes can you sell. But to me, when you're dealing with art, you have to remember that some of the things that run the deepest in the human psyche are the ones that take the longest to nurture. See, the thing is, art has never been about mass culture, ever. I mean, I wanted to do music which, I mean, I think was very clear to major label people that it, in fact, was uh, antithetical to everything they were doing. But I wanted to confront the audience. I wanted to confront their expectations. I wanted to confront all of the, 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 the fucking bullshit that they were falling for, that was being thrown at them all the time. A serious composer is expected to attract a lot of attention. I don't want to play that game. I'm not going to go out and, you know, get management and get agents, you know, and, and, and try to hook myself up with, a, you know, a, a major label that'll do a lot of PR. I mean, all of that to me is complete bullshit. I'm just not interested in that. And I mean, it's just, not only that, it's a mind fuck. You get involved with all these people, I mean, I don't want to say a whole lot of negative shit, but it's a bad scene. And I can tell you, in many cases, a lot of the people involved in that scene are bad people. Because the moment you start talking about money, you're talking about, I mean, to be brutally honest, crime, criminals, Thieves, bastards are attracted to money. If you're thinking about that kind of life, you don't want to go there, man. And for all the money they wanted to make, major labels weren't even that business savvy. These people that are sucking down 600000 a year in salary, you think somehow, I mean, you go into any other industry, they'd never earn that kind of money. And a lot of these guys got their jobs because they were somebody's, you know, brother or nephew or whatever. I mean, I'd say... 60 to 70 percent of the sales reps has ever walked into my office. I have no idea how they could ever get a job, let alone one that paid 80, 100 thousand dollars a year. I mean, they're just grossly overpaid for the skill set they have. And if you look in the book industry, the toy industry, the fashion industry, we trade in all those industries. There's no reps like that. The reps in those industries understand their product. They are hard selling you on the actual attributes of them that your customers care about. Not like, oh, here's some concert tickets. Ha ha. Now, what what is the record I'm trying to sell you? Sony used to send me the same box from four different locations with the same posters in it. None of them knew that the other one was the other office was sending. I did 600 of one poster. Like, that's why your CD is $17. The love of money also corrupted nearly all the music distribution channels. We listen to radio for news, for entertainment. It keeps us informed every minute of every day. Most of us depend upon radio more than we know. Radio was a huge force in breaking new music since the emergence of AM radio in the 1920s. At this time, less than 5% of all radio stations could be considered commercial. Radio was largely free-form. DJs could play the tunes they liked, when they wanted. But in the 1950s, radio changed. DJ Alan Freed, one of the first DJs to play African-American rhythm and blues and call it rock and roll, got caught taking bribes in exchange for song airtime at New York station WINS. Uh, what about the payola charges? 
What payola charges? Well, that are rife in the industry right now. Have you ever taken payola? No, I have not. It was a matter of your personal integrity, I think you said? Correct. Payola became a common practice in the 1950s in order to get songs heard on the radio. Soon Washington stepped in, and after the congressional payola hearings, Alan Freed drank himself to death in 1965. I'd love to answer all your questions, fellas. You know, I'd like to be nice, but my attorney wants doesn't want me to say a thing. So I'm trying my best. I just can't say I'm under subpoena here. The majors apparently still haven't learned from their mistakes. In 2005, Sony BMG, Warner, and Universal all settled million-dollar lawsuits with the state of New York for their use of independent promoters. These promoters were hired by major labels to get their new singles on the air any way they could. Airtime was bought for Sony BMG artists like J-Lo, who received 63 spins at the tune of $3,600. Or Take Good Charlotte, whose 250 spins cost Sony BMG $17,000. But today, controlling the airwaves isn't too hard. It hasn't been that hard since 1996. We will help to create an open marketplace where competition and innovation can move as quick as light. Good evening and welcome to the revolution. We begin tonight with all of the changes about to take place in the life of anyone who uses a phone or a television or a computer. It began today when President Clinton signed the bill that will revolutionize the industry. There are big changes coming in the way that we'll get television, telephone, and computer services. In 1996, the Telecommunications Act was passed with the promise of pursuing core public interest concerns of promoting diversity and competition. But what the Telecommunications Act of 1996 did was eliminate the rules on how many radio stations a corporate entity could own. Before the Telecom Act, large corporations controlled less than 65 radio stations. Today, Clear Channel owns nearly 1,200 radio stations, one in every 10, 99.9% .9 of the top 250 markets. Listeners said goodbye to regionality and creativity and hello to bland, homogenized programming. You remember the big problem? <laughs> the big problem, certainly. We have big problems every morning, Monday through Saturday. Well, the one that I was referring to was the one we mentioned just the other day about which way the water goes down the bathtub drain. As Clear Channel CEO Lowry Mays says, If anyone said we were in the radio business, it wouldn't be someone from our company. We're not in the business of providing news and information. We're not in the business of providing well-researched music. We're simply in the business of selling our customers products. A Berkeley School of Music study revealed that the biggest stations in the biggest markets were playing the same songs 58% of the time, and that the five owned by Clear Channel were playing the same songs 73% of the time. While this would seem to be quite the monopoly over the airwaves, Congress has turned a blind eye. Who could complain when $222 million was spent by the broadcast industry to lobby government officials from 1998 through June 2004? Between 1995 and 2003, media corporations and associations paid for 2,500 all-expense paid trips for FCC employees. Today it's no surprise that an entire generation seems to ignore radio altogether, as listenership is at a 27-year low. Once the whole Clear Channel thing uh, came around, it, it just cut off any supply chain for music, you know, and it'd be, it co-opted everything. So all of a sudden, you know, you're in a pay-to-play situation. Anywhere they could, they would get information about what people were listening to. And obviously it was just like a certain breed of people because they went to the radio stations and said, yeah, you're a rock format. But this is what people want to hear. You know, they want to hear Led Zeppelin, they want to hear Moody Blues, they want to hear Leonard Skinner, and dump the rest of that new shit you have. When I got into punk rock, I turned the radio off forever. Guys, for me, it just represented, like, the commercial interest of music, which I just was not, yeah, it was, it was over. And, then, and consequently, to this day, I still don't know most, like, top 40 or major label bands. This is the truth. I wouldn't know an Oasis song if it came up and kicked me in the ass. I don't even know what Guns N' Roses. I mean, I know I have an idea what they sound like, but I don't know their songs. Like in the, like the space of the time that we talk today, 
Like there'll be so much music made in the world that we could listen, it would be enough for us to listen to for the rest of our lives. So if you have such a vast pool to select, think about it, the history of music, how much music has been made. If you have such a vast pool of music to like select from, to listen to, why, why, le like, why leave it to people who have only their own, their profits at heart, like to decide what you hear? So I just turn that shit right off. The amount of times major labels have come to me and asked me, like, can you sell 300 CDs of our artists? Because if that CD marks in SoundScan for 300 in your city, we'll get radio play. And if they get radio play, that will get press. Like, the idea of it being so incestuous and so weird, it's just like, like, the idea that me sitting at my computer screen and typing in 300 and a sale will cause a band to get radio play is just, that's just, creepy and wrong we work against radio we don't work with them and i don't think anyone at a record store feels like radio is on their side but besides radio there was another strong force in the majors distribution channels mtv television used to be called the vast wasteland that was before music television mtv mtv launched in 1981 reaching tens of millions of homes all over the world in the beginning, MTV played just about every video it could get its hands on. MTV now plays more videos an hour, more videos in a row than ever before. Doodle doodle dee, wubba wubba wubba. But soon, MTV made it more expensive for labels and began to be very selective about the videos it would play. After all, it wasn't just about the music, but the image. If it weren't for MTV, we'd all be complete losers. Right, Dad? That's right, son. MTV, the most trusted name in music television. In the mid-90s, MTV conducted studies on what their demographics wanted. To increase advertising revenues and its audience share, MTV decided to feature more shows and less videos. This tastes awful! MTV, we're not known for our good taste. If the majors couldn't control MTV, they decided they could control each other. In recent years, the number of major labels has dwindled to a whopping four. In any market where power is concentrated in the hands of a few, competition and the quality and diversity of output suffers. Major labels sign alike bands, providing fans with few alternatives. And maybe this goes back to school and, you know, boys in this line, girls in this, this whole conditioning to uh, push up the herd tendencies. You know, if you want to get common ground about human beings, there's respect and tolerance because there's enough to share. But this idea that there's one music, there's one uh, hip, there's a, it is so dangerous for any kind of future, any kind of art, any kind of life in anything. I just... I don't know uh, totally why they're closing down, but I know it's been a long trend, and uh, it's a shame. Late 96 to about the middle of 98. We were tanking. It was really bad. I had boarders move in. They killed all my book sales. Um, Hot Topic was just born then. That killed all my mall rat sales. Um, there was another a shop opened up in the mall called TSX that was kind of similar to what we did. That killed whatever mall rat sales I had left after that. Uh, music in general was soft. Um, the internet was just starting to come into the equation and people were really turned on by that. Um, there were a lot of factors gaining up on us and it was grim. Man. I mean, we were really, we were bouncing checks and, you know, bouncing rent checks and uh, mortgage payment was late. I just remember very clearly one day, I, for some reason I had, I had the morning off or something, and I was in my backyard and I was laying in the grass and I looked at this grasshopper in the grass. And I looked at that grasshopper and it just hit me. I was like, you know what? This is my yard. That's my grass. That's my grasshopper. If I don't get my act together, I'm going to lose it. I just immediately sat down and started figuring out exactly what was going wrong, why it was going wrong, what I could control, what I couldn't, because I knew I didn't want to go back to work a job ever again. There's, I'm not going to bag anybody's groceries except mine. 
I believe that a lot of people would give up and say, well, that's it. We had a good run for 18 years, but now we've lost our space. And well, I remember when I used to work in that office, it wasn't so bad. I could go back to the office, but I'm not satisfied with that. That is not an option. I'm being chucked out, but I'm already thinking of what I'm going to do next. And, you know, we're going to take it on the road. We're going to go mobile, flexible, fast moving, um, here and there. We're going to go to the kids if they can't come to us. And we're going to keep it going. And the whole time that we're out there, we're going to be scanning the horizon, looking for that storefront that might have our name on it. And while many record stores have closed because of music industry woes, there's plenty that have closed for an entirely different reason. Not house records. <laughs> no, we probably don't have that. <laughs> mm. Ah, what do we have today? Oh, shit sandwich. Oh, you're gonna go home and listen to this with your mom. <laughs> hey, how does it feel to have no taste? <laughs> This is a piece of shit. Tell you what, let me do you a favor, okay? Let me do you a favor. <laughs> a lot of folks don't understand marketing, like, at all. Like, they just think it's because they're cool and they got a lot of old records around them, somehow that entitles them to a living. The American consumer is used to, it's gotta be shrunk wrap, I have to be able to find it, and I'm gonna, it's self-service, but it's got to be cheap. I mean, I was always a game player. I mean, I played in the World Backgammon Championships when I was 18. I've played in the World Series of Poker. I mean, you got to be, like, really competitive, I think, to stay, you know, current with with any industry. It's, a, yeah. it's not something you can take laid back. But once you have that sense of place, that place with the sound system, with the old posters, and you start thinking about the glory days of, oh, I remember when the Allman Brothers Band was in here doing a, an acoustic set or something. You're just living in the past. Like, how's that relevant to a 14-year-old kid today that has an iPod that he rips stuff off the web onto? I mean. But it's hard even for the great independent record stores, since the capitalist market isn't exactly a fair one these days. Looking to get music distributed more widely and to boost sales, both major and indie labels started to cut deals with major retailers like Walmart, Best Buy, Target, Barnes & Nobles, and Borders, otherwise known as big box stores. Big box stores represent 65% of the music retail market, up from 20% a decade ago. Today, America's largest music retailer is Walmart accounting for one in every five albums sold in the good old U.S. of A. The difference between a big box retailer and an independent store is, is the difference between a McRib sandwich and real barbecue. Um, they, they can't be compared. One is moving product. The other one is defining culture. That kind of cultural dissemination does not happen at major retailers. They're not interested in that. They're interested in making the quickest buck off of Joe Middle America in as short a time as they possibly can. We live music, they, they don't, you know, it's just product for them. And for us, it's, it's like a real emotional, emotional thing. When we sell someone, it's like giving them communion. No one at Target will recommend Hawkwind's Space Ritual Live to you, but I will recommend Hawkwind's Space, Space Ritual Live to you. Space is deep. Big box stores only carry a few thousand music titles, even though 30,000 albums are released each year. Most record stores carry at least 10,000 titles, and most independent retailers put attention and care towards what they're selling. Walmart doesn't care, man. That's just one more thing to sell, and as soon as they have something that will be more profitable or sell better in that same retail space, they'll switch to the next product line. And I think in the next few years you are going to see CD selections dwindle in those big box retailers, then the major labels are really going to be up a creek. I mean, Walmart originally, my understanding is, didn't bring in Buffy the Vampire uh, items because it was satanic. I mean, it's that stupid. 
or there's another large chain that won't go mention that you know there was a a, a Simpsons figure that's presumptively gay and they insisted that the manufacturer remove the gay character from the set for them to sell them. That's the corrosive part of big box. When you get people that are altering the content themselves, you know, when they pull Maxim magazine out of Walmart, you wonder what the hell's going on in the world? Because I guess it's too uh, risque. Now that's their choice, but when you're in a smaller community and you're a consumer, you don't have a choice because Walmart crushed everybody. And so you're left with what their cultural assortment is, and it's pretty fucked up assortment. Independent record stores are also an important place for local art and music scenes. A lot of times in a small town or a small city, a record could be made by a band. A band would make their own record and press up 200 copies. Back then, you could put up a nice sign in the record store. People would hear about it. You'd meet people. They'd know about your gig. They'd come down on Friday night to see you play. All because people would be in and out of the record store all week. Independent retail is important because the owners of the store pick the records. You know, they can get a whole town into some record that no one else likes in the whole world. If it weren't for indie stores, Dan and I wouldn't. We wouldn't have sold any records. You know, we wouldn't have been able to tour. You know, I mean, that's the whole reason when we went to Seattle the first time and there were 150 people there. It was because Sonic Boom was playing a record. And yet for the big box stores, CD sales only amount to less than 2% of overall revenue. Stores like Target and Best Buy price CDs below cost to lure customers into stores, hoping for impulse purchases on appliances, TVs, cameras, cell phones, you name it. Big box stores lose money on music with a loss leader strategy. As a result, independent record stores can't compete. A countless number of stores we talk to often bought their albums from Best Buy because it was cheaper there than getting the albums direct from labels or distributors. Sure, fans can save a few bucks at the big box stores, but if consumers don't support independent stores of all kinds, we're in danger of losing a part of American culture that can't easily be regained. Local businesses keep dollars in the community. Less than two cents of every dollar goes to the local payroll at the big box stores and one study revealed that towns with more local businesses are more civically active. Well, you know, it's the same kind of danger that uh, I started seeing when I was uh, a kid in the first small, in those days very small, supermarkets came along and began displacing the local grocery stores. Uh, and now this is just another step of it. That was the 1930s, but uh, I can remember very well that the, the local stores were uh, provided a sense of community. You meet people there, get to know people there. And, and of course, as soon as the first small supermarket came in, there's a dilemma. Uh, they're a little cheaper. And so you know, there's an incentive to shop there. On the other hand, you know that if you shop there, you're going to lose the community. And the fresh vegetables and the fresh bread and you know the friends and so on. And this is another larger stage of the same process. What it, it does is destroy the towns. So it's a question of what kind of life you want. You can live the life of an isolated atom, an atom of consumption, you know, uh, or a human being. You know. And the system is designed very consciously, of course, to uh, separate and atomize people. The, my primary motivation the last few years in just keeping at it is like, I just feel like towns should have places like this, you know, we, you know, we should have a music shop, we should have a place where like different ages of people can like meet each other, you know, it's not all just like, yeah, you know, just like what our culture is becoming in general, it's just, it's just giant places where people don't know your name, and, you know, I mean, it's, that's fine, but you know, the let more we lose places like this, not even just music places, but little restaurants, you know, places where, like, your father shopped. And, like, because when I was a kid, that meant a lot to me. Like, when I first got a bank account, it, like, it meant the world to me that when I went to the bank, like, the tellers knew my dad, you know? And, like, I didn't really need the sign for things, because they're, like, 
you know, oh, we know your father, you know, like that kind of feeling, and like that's just disappearing, and you know, we're just moving further apart from each other, and you know, there's there'll be consequences to that, but. I just miss the people, you know. I miss having a place. In terms of music, I miss being exposed, like, every day to new stuff. I miss that. I miss the conversation. I miss the excitement. Mostly I miss the customers, you know, those friendships and bonds. And To be good at selling music, you have to kind of, like, let people have to trust you, you know, like, because music's so personal to them. And if they have to trust you, they have to be willing to open up to you and vice versa. So you'd form a lot of these, like, really intense, like, personal relationships with people. And there is a degree of that where, like, then it's really not about music. What are you up to now? I don't know yet. <laughs> Cooking, maybe. I like to bake, so I might like start baking more. Yeah. If I can make a living doing that. Yeah. Probably I have no idea, yeah. you know, wherever I end up. <laughs> as hard as it is to see local stores go because of an unfair market, it's hard to blame music fans for going to cheap big box chains when CD prices rose 12.5% from 1991 to 2001. $10 CD makes a lot of sense to me. It's ten bucks on iTunes. Sell the physical CD for ten bucks and give them a little artwork and better sound quality, and I think you'll sell a ton more CDs. And the labels are just so resistant to doing that; they just will not do it. If they introduce an artist at ten bucks, like Amy Winehouse is the most recent example. It came out; it was a nine ninety nine CD. Um, then they raised the price to eleven ninety nine. We just got the memo last week, raising it again. Now it's going to be a fifteen dollar CD. And when she hits the one million mark, if it happens, it'll be 1898. I don't get it. And I guess that's when they feel like, oh, now we can cash in and make our money. But they need a whole new business model that allows them to make money on a $10 CD. Many independent bands and labels have made enough off a $10 CD to sustain their operations. Take Discord Records in Washington, D.C., who for 28 years have always kept albums affordable. We think about things in the real economy. We think about like, well, we know how much it costs to make. How much do you think it costs to make a CD with the packaging? Probably a dollar, something like that. Maybe a dollar. Yeah. Maybe eighty cents sometimes. You know, I mean, obviously you have to figure you have to figure in the other like the recording and the other sorts of stuff. In our case, you know, when we record bands like like three thousand dollars is basically the budget for recording. That's nothing, but. You know, our best-selling record now would be the Minor Threat material. And if you add together the vinyl, the cassette, and the CD of those, of those records, they're over 700000 of that just the Minor Threat stuff. Furthermore, one of the reasons we can sell records so cheap is that we actually don't do the same kind of promotions. People spend more on promotions than they do on recording records. I mean, I know people who spent more on making the video of their song for a major label than they did on recording the entire album. And the video got played one time on MTV. As major labels gouged fans with 16, 17, 18 dollar CDs, album sales plunged and independent record stores began closing at an alarming rate. In 2001, music sales fell for only the third time in 20 years. For the first time since 1966, no release sold over 5 million copies. Sales fell 2.5% in 2001, 6.8% in 2002, and from 2006 to 2007, album sales went down 20%. But after the year 2000, people decided they didn't want to buy so many CDs anymore. They didn't want to shop at independent record stores. They didn't want to listen to the radio and they sure as hell had had enough of the major labels pushing them around. Because one force would let them sidestep it all. From the first phonograph to the newest compact disc players, technology has long helped drive the music industry. Now the latest advance called MP3 comes via the internet. What we are is just, you know, 
four guys in San Diego, computer guys, who are, uh, you know, giving a shot at the music business. Robertson runs a website called mp3.com, named for a technology that makes it possible to record and distribute music with the click of a mouse. Unlike a regular record company, mp3.com gives artists a higher percentage of the profits and total control over their music. I could get to my fans immediately. It was fun, exciting, and I think there's a lot of that's being taken out of rock and roll. Idol likes the idea of distributing his own music independent of the record company's control. And your message to the record companies? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Finish me. that sentence. Kiss my ass. <laughs> Michael Robertson, he was a technologist. He and the people that he worked with monitored traffic on the internet. And they saw that the file format MP3 was this fast rising search term. They just wanted to have the domain. You know, they, I think he admitted to owning six records at the time, CDs. <laughs> you know, he knew nothing about the music industry. So, in our messaging and in how we launched the company and how we raised a lot of controversy, you know, I, I brought to the table and would think often about, you know, working with artists directly in the artist management capacity and, you know, the kind of pitholes and problems that the music industry had and how technology really provided a lot of solutions to that. And so to me, it was just as, it was almost overwhelming what a powerful opportunity it was. You know, you could be an artist in Sheboygi and all of a sudden you could, you know, upload an MP3 file and someone in Japan is listening to it. I remember sitting with some Warner executives when they had offices in Woburn and bringing them a page shot off of uh, mp3.com and it said, uh, why buy music when you can get it here for free? Uh, why support some fat record label executive driving around in Lexus? So I, before I, I asked him, I said, how many of you here have Lexuses? And two of them raised their hands and I passed out the copy. I said, these guys are gonna be trouble. Yes, a new day was rising in the music industry and the major labels were not happy. Within two years of its initial popularity, MP3 had surpassed sex as the top searched word on the internet. The Wall Street Journal reported in 1999 that the MP3 has created an underground online culture in which hackers hang around chat rooms and online gangs prowl for tunes. MP3.com was sued and litigated by Universal Music Group until they acquired it and ran it into the ground. And this was just a sign of things to come. In September of 1999, Napster, the music file sharing phenomenon launched. Napster had 26.4 million users worldwide at its peak in 2001. Rather than realize and embrace this new technology as an opportunity to expose, share, and deliver new music, the major labels sat by with their team of lawyers ready to attack. And this is the group of successful men who have the imagination and the courage to say, why not? Right now, this war goes beyond their heads. This is like the power goes back to the people. Because the industry has, over the last 15, 16 years, has been accountant and lawyer driven. But and you a clear cannot plan. look me in the eye and tell me that they're not doing it for some kind of profit. But they're, do, they're doing it because they, they could be technical nerds that just love to see change every second. You got cats out there. The kid that got involved with Napster, you think yeah. he had... You, you know what, I respect you, man. Is not buying I respect it. you, but, I, you know, in the United States, nobody does anything for free, Lawrence, man. you on. got people out there that will buy your album even if they after they download it. Why do you think Blockbuster is a big industry when people could tape off of HBO, I'm Cinemax, and Showtime? I, I, they I've still will people, go get it. I've talked to people who are sitting there going, I downloaded one of your songs from Napster, I went out and bought the record, Wonderful, God bless you. But does that mean that I can't still go after Napster? I mean, oh no, I think no, no, it's no, 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 no. I just think it's ignorant to sit there and say that just because you take it away from the record business and the record companies and you hand it over to all these other people that make it available in a different way, that there's not going to be the same profiteering from that. In July of 2000, AM Records, along with nine other record companies, sued Napster for copyright infringement. And in 2001, Napster was shut down. A countless number of file sharing alternatives sprouted up as the major labels scurried to shut them down. There was even a Christian file sharing network called ZPOC. But the majors had a new idea, target the downloaders. They brought suits against leading internet service providers like Verizon to try and obtain the names and addresses of file sharing clients. 
The majors ultimately failed, but they weren't just going to stop there. After September 11th, the Recording Industry Association of America, a trade group of major and indie labels and distributors, tried to piggyback anti-file sharing proposals on the Patriot Act to make it legal to search computers and sabotage systems. By September 2004, the RIAA had filed suit against 4,769 people. 1,024 settled for as much as $5,000. Nothing could stop file shares because it's hard to beat free and people finally had choice. Who could blame downloaders when from 1999 to 2001 there were 25% less titles released on major labels and CD prices rose 9.2% reaching an all-time high in the year 2000. At the same time, majors reduced the units of CD singles shipped by 74% in 2001, hoping to cash in on full album sales. File sharing allows users to access 9 million tracks at any given time, roughly a million albums worth. It was reported in 2005 by Big Champagne, an online research group, that more files were being downloaded each month than music sold legally by the music industry 12 to 1. The Pew Internet American Life Project studies have revealed that file sharing is the most popular way for kids to get music, growing 100% a year. For so long, businesses were just, let's treat our customer base like suckers. Let's charge $18.98 for a new CD. Let's, uh, let's sue them if they download something. Uh, let's keep repackaging stuff. Let's not give them any choices. The very people that are supposed to keep you in business, you are treating like garbage. And so you have this whole generation of people who are growing up with an antagonistic relationship with record labels. And they're not delineating between you two who has $42 billion in the bank or one of our bands. I mean, Napster, of course, was a phenomenon that, uh, you know, definitely led so the promotion, the idea of how easy it was to share. We used to be like doing mixtapes and that kind of thing. Somebody puts one of our songs on their MySpace page. It's instantaneous. It's like ultimate free advertising. I just think like in the old days of like, we, it was like nobody would even know we had a record out, you know? It's like you'd put, press like a thousand copies and hope you get somebody's attention. And that's, I feel for like all the bands that I love, that my best friends that are struggling like that. And while the majors tried to squash technology, hardware makers embraced it. Computers started to come standard with CD burners, and the price of CD burning decks for stereo units began to drop. Fans could copy CDs with no sonic loss for about 25 cents a disc. To combat CD burning, the majors began putting spyware encryption on new CDs by artists like Neil Diamond and Sarah McLaughlin. Rather odd choices, but these encrypted disks infected a lot of computers with a lot of viruses. By October 2003, Universal had finally woken up and reduced CD prices to the low, low price of $12.95. But what the majors failed to realize is that people had already found a different way to listen and even pay for music, if they still wanted to do that anymore. We know how to make really cool small devices. We know how to make them beautiful and fun iPod is this amazing digital device that fits in your pocket. It carries over a thousand songs. So now you can take your entire music library with you wherever you go. The choice we made was music. Now why music? Well, we love music. And it's always good to do something you love. More importantly, music's a part of everyone's life. Everyone. Music's been around forever. It will always be around. This is not a speculative market. And because it's a part of everyone's life, it's a very large target market all around the world. It knows no boundaries. But interestingly enough, in this whole new digital music revolution, there is no market leader. In 2001, Apple CEO Steve Jobs issued the iPod. By early 2006, Apple sold 42 million iPods. And by April 2007, that number had jumped to over 100 million iPods sold. Steve Jobs had also struck a licensing deal with the major record companies for iTunes, a legal digital music vendor that allowed fans to buy single tracks for 99 cents. It was all so easy, even an idiot could figure it out. So you want to go, uh, I'm up to two and a quarter. You want to go artist or playlist? Artist. 
Uh, Beach Boys, Beatles, uh, Alan Jackson, Alan Jackson, Alejandro, Allison Krauss, The Angels, The Archies, Aretha Franklin. I got the shuffle, lightweight. Crank it on, and you shuffle the shuffle. So you, so you, so it plays Put in a random pocket, order. Put got the hits, got the ear things so on. So it plays in a random order. Yeah. You don't know what you're gonna get. No. But you know. And if you don't like it, though, you get the advance button. It's pretty high tech stuff. I mean, obviously, everybody talks about the digital and the convenience this came in America. It always has been. If you can sit at home and get a movie delivered to you, if you can buy fast food that you don't have to prepare yourself, if you can get music digitally, it's very convenient. And convenience will win out many, 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 many times. Um, and the ability to take it for free. I mean, seriously, rising gas prices, the economy is a little stifled. Um, you've got 6, 8, 10, 12, 15, 20 major corporations who are spending millions and or billions of dollars to advertise to change your way of thinking about how you acquire music or movies or technology or whatever. Uh, imagine if the independent record stores had the advertising budgets that Apple has or that Microsoft has or that whatever. Everyone would be shopping at independent record stores because you'd hear it a thousand times a day everywhere. It's really easy for us to at least see how the internet and downloading has hurt major labels. Because the whole point of an album coming out on a major label is that it has, you know, two, three, four singles that they can play on the radio. And in the past, people would hear those songs then go out and buy the album and find out the rest of it is no good. But now they can just buy those three songs on iTunes and not have to deal with the rest of the crap on the album. Because people are too smart to you know, waste their money, especially when you have to get a lot of that stuff at the mall or something and it costs $18.99. Digital downloads account for 10 to 15% of the market as CDs still account for 80 to 85 percent of all music sold. To this day, iTunes carries less than 1 percent of the available music catalog in the world. Somewhere around 50 percent of all recordings have never even made it to CD. Fortunately, the Internet is one great tool of connectivity that allows us to search, find, and obtain almost anything we want. Now, I used to love to go to the record stores. I used to love to go to the bookstores. The problem is, I don't love pay paying like ridiculously high prices, just like everybody else. What are we supposed to do? I mean, the problem is when I go online and my computer's sitting right there, there's nothing I can't fucking find, either on Amazon or eBay. I don't care how fucking obscure it is. Not only can I find it, I can probably find it at some ridiculously good price. And, uh... As you can see, there's a hell of a lot of books here, you know, and most of them have been purchased on, uh, on Amazon at ridiculously good prices. And, I mean, I can't afford, I'm not rich, I can't afford to just go and buy whatever the fuck I want to buy whenever I want to buy it, you know, at whatever price it is. And, uh, you know, how, how, are the, how are these stores going to compete? And, I mean, I think we're just going to have to, like, give it up, man. I mean we're not going to be going to stores anymore of any kind. I think they'll, they'll have to come back in a way. And because, you know, dealing with it on the Internet and dealing with it online, it's really, uh, it's really lonely and boring. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's probably why there's such a proliferation of black metal now, because it's like such a lonely, boring, vacuous kind of music, which I kind of completely I love it for that. And uh, I really like the whole isolationist aspect of, of misery that, that, is, that is in that kind of scene. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a fan of the download. I like to hit enter and have the song appear on my iTunes within seconds. But there's something about holding the artifact, about feeling it in your hand. It reveals a lot about the moment in time that this record was made. An abstract song, you know, could come from anywhere, but if you see something in a 12-inch vinyl LP with the cover art, or you hear the scratch in the 78, you get a sense of time and place that, for me, is, is irreplaceable. In the end, it's probably going to be people, if you can make the experience personable. Or do people like being uh, a robot world or something, you know? 
a world without people and just being uh, serviced. I can't tell you how important it was to go to Zed and sit around there, and then the people would come in the store too, the other, it was just a place, uh, a gathering places of uh, views and ideas. I met all these other different kinds of people from different trips on life, and the common thing, the lingua franca, was it was the music. I did, there was no kind of community like, if you went in a chain store, you would have to know kind of what you wanted, right? And there was no one to rap to, there was no bullshit sessions about stuff. Uh, people to turn you on, check this out. Yeah, it was a, a, a way more sterile kind of thing. And that that's the real sadness of losing them, the sense of community and stuff like this. Community, there's that word. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, I think that that's sort of lost. I mean, it's good that you can talk with all these people all over the world, but are you ever going to meet them face-to-face -face unless you meet up at a concert? But or... who wants to meet them face-to-face? -face? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Jesus Christ, I mean, like, you know? Like what, do you want them, like, people, like, you know, <laughs> come to your house going, I got this new record. <laughs> no, buddy, go home and play it, I, you know. I mean, who wants to meet more people? The internet is and should not be the end all for independent record stores. It is merely another force, another way of interacting with music lovers, and a new way of obtaining music. After all, there has been a resurgence of vinyl, a format that the music pundits have been declaring the death of since the introduction of the compact disc. Part of why people quit buying records is because they quit making records. Instead, you bought these little crappy little pieces of plastic, you know, and the artwork's gone. I mean, you know, you know, I, mean, I think of artwork, I think of, you know, artwork, you know, <laughs> you know big album covers, and, and you, don't, you don't get that in a jewel case, you know. And the only thing they made at this plant when I bought it was 45s. And so once I got into it, uh, I thought I was going to make CDs, cassettes, and all this other stuff. And I basically sat back and said, you know, I'm going to figure out how to make final records. Wow. My son was terribly worried. He basically looked at me and he says, Dad, haven't you heard of MP3s? Vinyl requires that you sit down and listen to the music. MP3 players basically give you the optimal portability. Wherever you are, whatever time, you get portability of that music. Now folks have, let's assume for a minute, they've gotten to the end of that road of portability. Now what they're doing is saying, okay, I've got my portability, I've got my quantity, now I want my quality. And what's happening with that is they're now flipping back around and saying, okay, give me the quality, give me the listening experience. And I think that is what part of the market is gonna want. What happens in the digital world is you're taking a sample of that sound wave. By definition, you will never get 100% of the sound wave. You can't. It is impo mathematically impossible. So what the analog world does, it reproduces 100% of that sound wave. Could you see yourself doing anything else down the road? or? Not really. That's the, that's the scariest thing. <laughs> I don't know what else I'd be doing. Lord knows I could never go back to being a CPA. <laughs> well, Trash American Style was really um, exciting for me because I had moved out of uh, Bethel, Connecticut. And I was already living in New York since like late 76, early 77. But I remember coming to uh, visit my, um, my mother in Connecticut and sort of seeing a... Um, a flyer for Trash American Style somewhere, like on a uh, on, on a light on a uh, telephone pole, and being curious about it because it said like you know we sell punk, new wave, and etc. And I was like, I thought that was like complete revolution, you know, like that that actually existed in this area of Connecticut. I mean, it was like it, it was Malcolm uh, and his his wife girlfriend. They were really into punk and kind of like at that time hardcore. They had this sort of sort of wildness to their store, you know. And uh, 
but yeah, you know, Malcolm Weiser had this really great acerbic sarcasm about things, and it was kind of fun, you know. Um, that's too bad their store doesn't exist anymore. On May 4th, when we got the last van load of stuff out there, and we had left the place broom clean, as the landlord liked to call it, it was just an empty room. It was amazing. It was just like the last 18 years that we were in that one location, just like nothing. It never happened. Nothing ever happened there. Cool bands never played there. Nobody ever met there. Um, nobody discovered, wow, I can't believe you got this. You know, nobody discovered any, it's like nothing happened. Nothing. It was just an empty room and another bland, generic, dull storefront on Mill Plain Road in Danbury. What's the one thing you miss about the store? Uh, definitely the sense of community and the fellowship. You know, it's definitely here when I do these road gigs, you know, I talk to people all day. There's really not a whole lot of continuity with doing something like this. Like, I'll, I'll meet some cool people and I'll see them two times a semester. Whereas at the store, it was like, you know, we had the clubhouse. Anybody could walk in the door at any time. And that's completely gone. And when I talk to people now, that's what they say they miss the most. You know, I don't think it was the store so much, the merchandise so much, they just have one less place to go now. I miss it. It's just like getting cut off from, because there's people that I would see all the time, but I don't know where they live. They're not really friends of mine, but they are. And I'll see people out and they don't even recognize me because it was like a thing going there, you know? And it's just weird. I feel like I kind of, it's like retirement, I guess, when people get retired and they're just like, I feel lost and... It's like I kind of get it. It's like you just wake up and you don't have this place to go to anymore after going there for, you know, a long time, decades. We had police as customers. We had, you know, junkies trading stuff in. We had little suicidal children and we had little nine-year-old brilliant children and, uh, you know, people getting divorced, people getting ill, people getting better. And it was just like you got to come in and it, it was like going to a favorite aunt's house or cousin's house or something and it was kind of a stop some people would come in once every two years we had these kids that drove down from Canada like every now and then just to buy hardcore records you know and it was just something that you know I used to have a lot of those little places and they were like thrift stores or little little breakfast nooks and that kind of stuff is all gone now it's just it's not the same and people are supporting the reason People have done it all to themselves. Everything that has gone on, it's because of our ignorance. There was a point where I felt the more we lost places like that, not just record stores, all kinds of small businesses that are an actual reflection of the community they're in and serve the community they're in, I felt it was important to keep that going. It's not so much a music store, but like we were also an example of like, you know, independence. You know? Yeah, I'll hold it like that. There you go. Little surfboard. <laughs> Got it? Yeah. Getting me in there too. Yeah. Huh? All right. <laughs> I was really kind of casting about trying to figure out what to do and what I wanted to do, and then I realized that I. I needed to make money <laughs> and I needed to be a little less specific and I realized that most of my experience over the years was in retail and um, so and I, I have an interest in food so I applied at like some local grocery stores and whatnot and uh, in December I got a job at Trader Joe's and I've been there for about well since December four months I probably run into 30 or 40 people who used to shop in the record store and then, you know, they, they go to Trader Joe's as well. And um, that's kind of neat, you know, but it's also like very bittersweet, you know, because like mostly, oh, I miss you and what happened? And it's like, it's like this death in the family type conversation. <laughs> but I haven't gotten, mostly I've gotten joy from those people. I haven't got this kind of like, Oh, you're wearing a name tag, and like, how sad, or something. Like, I haven't gotten a bit of that. It's, I think the relationships I fostered at this store were very personal ones, so like, people are just happy to see me. 
you know, and like wonder what I'm doing. And then the store is a separate thing. It's personal for them where they miss it in their lives. And I'm usually able to agree with that. I miss it in my life. So up until this point, it's been pretty grim, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I've... Please don't I, tell me it's been nothing but grim. No, I, no. I decided a while back to open a store. I had dropped out of college. I was doing a distro, like, at least, I guess you would consider it part-time because I was doing three or four shows a week. And eventually it got really big. I don't know, it was like, okay, now or never. And then I asked Rick, and Rick w didn't tell, didn't say a word for like three months. And then one day he was like, oh, that thing you asked me? Yeah, I'll do that. And then we, I don't know, f figured out what we needed to do to like operate a business and like make it legit. And then found a, a place and built some racks and put stuff in here and that's it. Since we've opened, like we've met hundreds of people who would have had no place to go. And honestly, I don't really, there's not a whole lot else that I could see myself doing. <laughs> Like for a living, I always like the idea of being able to like hang out somewhere that's not my house, which is basically if you're buying stuff off the internet only or only like occasionally when you go to a show, the rest of the time you're just sitting in your house. You don't really have anywhere to go. People can come here and just hang out. I mean, how long do you guys think you'll be doing this? I mean, like... Ideally forever. <laughs> like realistically, I don't know. circumstance or another they're not doing it anymore maybe they got screwed maybe whatever and they're not doing it anymore they're working at a hardware store they're working at a sporting goods supply shop they're uh, doing the nine to five thing I don't think that one should ever be reduced to having to do something like that if that's what you want to do fine go ahead and do it but don't end up being one of those frustrated people that's there because you have to be there I mean, I think you should always do what you want to do. You should always make a living off your art. You should always pursue your vision. And after 21 years, my landlord pulled me up by the roots and threw me to the side of the road. But I'm not stopping. I'm still here. And to quote Gigi Allen, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. And I'm not giving up. Enough said.
tastes terminated around the 1940s. <laughs> Anything since then is what I pick up from. Like in the 60s, I had to listen to a lot of this stuff because that's what all the activists, you know, the meetings were, but not, it's not for me. And now it's my grandchildren listening to whatever that stuff is, hip hop or something. But uh, I'm an old fashioned conservative, so I can't answer. <laughs>